So the idea really that you're advancing, if reality is a creative construct, then does that mean that physical objects are hallucinations? I mean, Maria's already distinguished between the ones that are, the hallucinations that are, and then things that aren't actually hallucinations. Are you arguing then that everything that we think is an object before us is actually a construction? That's a great question. So, so the idea is first that space-time itself is not the pre-existing stage on which the drama of life plays out. It's a data structure that you create when you open your eyes. You are the author of space and time. You're not just a little entity stuck inside of space and time, you create it. And every physical object that you see is also a data structure that you create. Imagine that you're in a virtual reality. You have a headset on. As you look over here, you can see a three-dimensional chair that you're seeing. As soon as you move your headset over here, you know that you no longer render the chair. You've sort of thrown it away. I'm saying that's going on right now. We all have headsets on. I'm creating the glass. I just destroyed it. The, the objects exist as we create them. They're telling us fitness payoffs and how to get them. Now, the difference between illusions, perceptions that are illusory versus non-illusory, the standard definition is something is illusory if it doesn't correspond to reality, and it's ver veridical or true if it corresponds to reality. I give a different definition. Something is illusory, this is now an evolutionary definition. My perception of an object is illusory if it does not guide adaptive action. And it's truthful if it guides adaptive action. So it's a different twist. Instead of saying it's illusory if it doesn't correspond to reality, I go completely evolutionary. I say it's, it's illusory if it doesn't guide adaptive action. So for example, if I give you a sugar cube, you know from the 3D geometry how to pick it up and how to use it and how to put it in your mouth if you want. If I show you a Necker cube, one of these line drawings that's just a bunch of lines on a flat sheet of paper but you see a cube popping out, that's illusory. Even though you see a cube, it's illusory because it doesn't guide adaptive action. If you try to grab that three-dimensional shape, you can't do anything. So just change truth for adaptive action and you get the new definition of veridical perception versus illusory perception. So for the, can you explain a bit to the audience, this, this has then evolution in mind. You're saying that there's an aspect of this, this is about how we survive and that, go on to create more that, humans that will then survive. Is this the basis of your argument? That's right. So, so this is now, what I'm about to say next is very, very common among my colleagues. All of my colleagues will say that our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection. That's, that's, that's uniform. So it's all about survival and reproductive fitness. Where I differ is I say, knowing anything about the truth will not help your reproductive fitness. So there's no selection pressures to know anything about the truth. This is just what you get is a user interface that hides the truth. So for example, if you're writing an email and the icon for the email that you're writing is blue and rectangular in the middle of your screen on your desktop, does that mean that the email itself, the file, is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your computer? Of course not. Anybody who thought that doesn't understand what the desktop is for. It's not there to show the truth in this metaphor, the diodes, resistors, the voltages, and magnetic fields. It's there to hide all that truth. If you had to toggle voltages to send an email, your friends would never hear from you. So what happens is you have a user interface, we pay good money for the interface to hide the truth you don't need to know the truth, and yet you can control the circuits without even knowing that the circuits exist. And that's what evolution has done. It hides reality, whatever reality might be, it gives us eye candy, a user interface that lets us control reality while we're utterly ignorant about what that reality is. But there's no selection pressures for us to realize that, so we take our virtual reality to be the ultimate reality. I just want to ask you one more question on this before I bring in the rest of the panel. So we've heard lots of physicists, you may have heard them at this festival saying that, for example, this table you know, is just comprised mainly of empty space and so on. You seem to be going further indeed than the physicists on this. That's that right. right, that's right. It, it, you might think that I'm saying something that the physicists have already said. Rutherford said uh, you know, a century ago that uh, this table might look solid, but it's mostly empty space. There's a nucleus and an electron far away, and it's mostly empty space. So our perception doesn't match reality. I'm saying something different. It's much like, what they're saying is much like this. I know that that blue icon on my desktop isn't the real reality of the file, but if I get my magnifying glass out and I look really closely, I can see little pixels, and that's the truth. 
well, no, you're still in the desktop. You're still in the screen. Atoms and electrons and protons are still inside space and time. Anything inside space and time is just within your interface. It's not the objective reality. I'll put it this way. I'm not saying simply that our perceptions get the shape wrong a little bit or the colors wrong. It's that the very language of space and time, of shapes and colors and physical objects, is the wrong language. You could not possibly describe objective reality using that language. Just like you can't describe the circuits of a computer using pixels of the desktop. Cannot do it. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.